Thank you for joining me for this session of Pure Hedgehog Nerdiness. I'm Dr. Sophie Lund Rasmussen, or Dr. Hedgehog, and I absolutely adore hedgehogs. I've made it my life's mission to study them, to understand why the European hedgehog is declining and what we can do to stop this decline. In October 2024, something really important happened to the European hedgehogs. Their conservation status was updated from least concerned to near threatened on the IUCN red list of threatened species covering the whole of Europe. I was one of the two experts asked to assess their conservation status and provide the report leading to this status change alongside my colleague Abigail Gasset. Whether we like it or not, the hedgehogs are in big trouble. They're declining massively, with up to 75% since the turn of the century in the rural areas of the UK. So why did we let it get this far? I mean, the hedgehogs are such amazing nature ambassadors. How did their conservation status The, the hedgehog is the most favorite mammal in the UK. How did it, did it get to this stage? We're ultimately causing the decline of the hedgehog. And can we live with ourselves if we end up causing their extinction? So why are the hedgehogs disappearing? I've tried to approach this question from a range of different angles. Uh, and we need to know what we're up against if we want to optimize the conservation strategies to save the hedgehogs. So for the past 10 years, I've gathered and led specialized research teams exploring different factors. I'm researching hedgehog uh, safety and robotic lawnmowers. I'm collaborating with the industry to design hedgehog-friendly robotic lawnmowers. We've also made a 3D printed crash test dummy, which we can use in the standardized safety tests we have created. We're now trying to get them implemented into the product standards of these robotic lawnmowers, leading to a labeling system informing the buyers on with which machines that are hedgehog friendly. I've also studied ecotoxicology in the hedgehogs, finding that pesticide accumulation happens in nine out of 10 hedgehogs tested. So every time we tested 10 hedgehogs, nine of them had pesticides in their livers. I've also studied hedgehog genetics, hedgehog endoparasites, MRSA in hedgehogs and antimicrobial resistance, hedgehog microbiomes, stress in hedgehogs, dental health in hedgehogs, hedgehog hibernation, hedgehog hearing, and the post-release survival of hand-raised hucklets. And yes, the baby hedgehogs are called hucklets. I've studied hedgehog survival and behavior in the suburbs, hedgehog personality, hedgehog diets, hereditary diseases and syndromes in hedgehogs, kidney disease, tick-borne diseases in hedgehogs, and I run a conservation program for the European hedgehog in Denmark with the World Wildlife Fund in Denmark, where we arrange annual national hedgehog counts to monitor the population and document the decline. We also educate members of the public on how to make their gardens hedgehog friendly. <coughs> I mean, so the short version is that I'm really doing my best to understand why the hedgehogs are declining, even with the limited funds available for hedgehog research, because it's just not very competitive to study cute hedgehogs when you're competing for funding with people curing cancer, understandably. I would just wish that there would be enough resources to cover both subjects. But let's get back to the hedgehogs. So, Since we're destroying their natural habitats, the hedgehogs are increasingly moving in to areas of human occupation. So they are moving into our gardens. The battle to save the hedgehogs is going to take place in our own backyards. And this is why I decided to mark uh, juvenile hedgehogs in the suburbs of Copenhagen with radio tags glued onto their spines, enabling me to track them and follow them for their first year of life. 
because I wanted to understand everything about these mysterious creatures, where they lived, how far they walked every night, where they nested, how many gardens they would consider their home, what they were eating, which dangers they faced, how much weight they gained, and what the optimal weight was to survive their first hibernation. And of course, also their survival and causes of death, because if I wanted to inform members of the public on how to make their gardens hedgehog friendly, I had to discover which challenges they faced in that type of habitat. So this is me in full armor, radio tracking hedgehogs at night in the suburbs of Copenhagen almost every night for a whole year. It took a lot of effort and energy because the hedgehogs are nocturnal, so it was a lot of hard work, especially on the cold and rainy nights. My family and friends soon realized that if they wanted to see me during that year, they had to join me. So they brought cake and coffee, and we had the best time radio tracking hedgehogs. Before I started that project, I, I remember thinking to myself, how come nobody had really studied hedgehogs in suburbia before? And I soon learned why. So first of all, the hedgehogs would always be in the wrong gardens. And by wrong gardens, I mean the gardens I did not have access to. So I would have to stand peeping through the fences and hedges of people's gardens, looking straight into to the garden, finding the hedgehog sitting there with a big grin on his face, waving at me, <laughs> can't catch me. Uh, and that was really frustrating. And second of all, for some odd reason, and I really don't know why, people found it extremely suspicious that I was walking around residential areas at night with no apparent direction or purpose, with a big head torch and a massive backpack on my back, strange noisy equipment, peeping with great interest through the hedges and into people's houses, um, and sometimes coming crawling out of bushes with leaves and branches stuck to my hair. Uh, I don't know why, but you can judge for yourself because I brought a video showing what it looked like. That's just like the hedgehog, radio tracking hedgehogs, like any normal person would do, right? The problem is just that I'm the only hedgehog researcher in Denmark, so nobody knew it was even a type of work. Yeah, that's me. So, um, yeah, let me put it this way. I got on a first-name basis with the local police force. <laughs> Uh, they would be called out regularly. And, and we ended up with a routine where they went, oh, hi, Sophie, it's you again. Yeah, how, uh, how the hawk's doing? Yeah, well, they're great. What, what, what about that number 22 that got bitten by a dog? Is he out again? Yeah, yeah, he's great. Okay, have a great one. <laughs> and then they would leave again. And it was during one of those nights that I started to wonder uh, about the hedgehogs because... I learned that they left quite a lot of um, business cards on the lawn. Uh, they basically left a stinky trail of poo behind them. And could I make use of this in some way? Perhaps I could study biodiversity. And I just have to say that hedgehog poo is the shit. I mean, this small sample collects a smelly gold mine of knowledge. And this is because the hedgehogs tend to live in a very small area throughout their lives. They only inhabit 10 to 14 gardens. This was what my research showed. They eat a wide variety of food items. Basically, they primarily feed on insects and snails and slugs uh, and worms, but they also scavenge on dead animals, like a nice roadkill, a badger, or a fox. They also like birds' eggs, but this is, of course, the ground-nesting bird's eggs because hedgehogs, unfortunately, cannot climb trees. Um, but they also, uh, and people don't recognize that, but this charming little creature is actually a ferocious predator. I mean, if they can get their jaws or, well, paws, or, yeah, if they can catch a live prey, a live animal, they will, and they will eat it. And I mean, they go for 
chicks falling out of the nests, amphibians such as frogs or uh, lizards or newt salamanders. And they also take on, I mean, I've witnessed them take on agile Uh, adult pigeons and full-sized chickens and winning. They just lash on to, to the necks of these creatures and waiting for them to give up, and they would tear them apart. So they are ferocious predators. And, uh, and they also uh, have this strange behavior called self-anointing. So they will chew on something really smelly, like a predator fecal sample, and they will chew it up and spread the saliva all across their spines. We believe it's to cover their scent against predators, but this would also show up in the fecal sample of the hedgehog. They don't eat plants, but they do eat fruit sometimes, and we're not sure whether they target the fruit or the worms and insects on the fruit. But nevertheless, fruit would show up in the samples as well. And because they feed on insects, snails, slugs, eating plants, the plants would also show up in the analysis. Yes. So, back in the days, it was really hard to tell the diet of a hedgehog when you had to look at the poo samples and distinguish what they had been eating. Because... Obviously, you can imagine what happens when a slug has gone through the digestive tract of a hedgehog. There's not enough, uh, a nut left. I mean, there's no snake or slug left, basically. And if you cut open the stomachs of dead hedgehogs and find a chewed off beetle leg, for example, it's really hard to determine the species based on a beetle leg. But with modern DNA methods, we can distinguish exactly what the hedgehogs have been eating. And we use environmental DNA or eDNA analysis to do this. And then we can actually explore biodiversity locally. Um, and if we chose another type of sample, I mean, for example, a uh, uh, species which would not eat as broad as a range of different food items as the hedgehog, or a bird species that would be able to eat something and transport itself 200 kilometers away and then defecate, then we wouldn't get the representation of the local biodiversity. But the hedgehogs provide the full package solution. They poop a lot. They stay in the same area throughout their lives. They feed on a wide range of different food items, And the plants still show up in the DNA samples because they eat prey that feed on these plants. So if we just manage to keep the hedgehog population going, we won't run out of samples anytime soon. And studying biodiversity is, of course, extremely important nowadays. We see a drastic loss of biodiversity, and we need to find good and reliable methods of measuring and monitoring biodiversity. And I have to admit that creating this research field, I mean, biodiversity monitoring through hedgehog poo, has been quite challenging. I guess that's what it's like to be a first mover. But I've been laughed at, I've been ridiculed. I got a funding rejection letter stating that my method was airy-fairy and absurd, but I wouldn't let it stop me. So I gathered a team of researchers spending their whole summer holiday collecting hedgehog poo. And this is me finding my first hedgehog poo on that show. What a wonderful moment. Um, I also asked the hedgehog carers of Denmark and the UK to collect samples for me. And I had a lot of samples in store from the Danish Hedgehog Project, where I asked citizens to collect dead hedgehogs for my research. So now I have over 800 hedgehog poos stored in the freezer, and we have started the work of analyzing the DNA from these samples. And we found some really interesting results already. When I've secured the funding we need to uh, test all the remaining samples, I will update you on social media. I promise. So the approach of using the European hedgehog as a model species to study subjects that are relevant to us all, for example, antimicrobial resistance, uh, pesticide exposure and accumulation, and 
biodiversity, I'll hopefully be able to collect enough funding to continue my research to save the hedgehogs. But it's not too late. If we stand together and do our best to save the hedgehogs, we can turn this situation around. And what you can do is to support your local hedgehog rescue, support the NGOs working for hedgehog conservation, participate in the national hedgehog counts out there, and participate in sur surveys where they explore different topics about hedgehog ecology. You can also turn your garden into a hedgehog haven, and you can do so by finding information online. You can go to the Hedgehog Street Campaign website, British Hedgehog Preservation Society's website, or for the Danish, visit denmarkspinsvin.dk. Or you can visit my YouTube channel, where I've made videos on how to make your garden hedgehog friendly. You can find me on social media if you want to explore my research and follow my endeavor to save the hedgehogs. You just have to search for Dr. Hedgehog. Thank you for going on this amazing journey, prickly adventure. Thank you for listening.